thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my wonderful co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Hey, how y'all doing? Good, good. How, how are you today? I'm doing good, and I feel like I'm on an everlasting episode of Where's, Where's Waldo, right? Because I'm always, <laughs> I'm never at home. I'm always on the road. And uh, today I'm at uh, Eglin Air Force Base in, in the Panhandle of Florida. And I want to let everybody know that I'm at an F-35 base. So if you hear the sound of freedom uh, while, while I'm asking a question, uh, just please excuse me because we're, we're we're kicking some butt over here. So um, uh, <laughs> I, I won't I won't belabor that point at, at all. Um, and we have an amazing guest today, and I'm super excited to to talk to him. And uh, without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is a retired Lieutenant General in the United States Army. He received the Medal of Honor from President Johnson for an incredible act of heroism during the Vietnam War. He joins us today to recount his days in Vietnam and give us a military exclusive look at his book, Standing Tall, Leadership Lessons in the Life of a Soldier, which is available at shopmyexchange.com and in select stores. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Lieutenant General Robert Foley. Hey. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kiana and, and Emily and uh, Chief Master. And I, I want to just tell you, I, I haven't had much time to do this, but um, this is a um, excellent program that you have. Uh, I've, I've seen, I don't know, I've scanned through several videos uh, and um, they're positive, they're upbeat, uh, very professionally done. I know it takes a lot of work to do these and to put this all together, uh, but um, uh, they, um, they, they inform and they educate. And in some cases, they're inspirational. And I was um, uh, looking last night at a video you did with uh, Shaquille O'Neal. And, and you know, he's inspirational just because he's a basketball icon. But he's so much more than that. When he was talking to you about, um, he was a uh, 80s kid. And he was in the Army family. And he was moving around from post to post and base to base and learning about discipline, how important discipline is. And uh, his father uh, gave him a sense of values and those things that he needed to have and the discipline he needed to have. And, you know, when you see, when, when the followers of this program see that, they realize that there are a lot of uh, goodness about seeing other people's experiences and what they do and how they do, and how they do things. And the other thing I, I would just say, and I don't want to take too much time in doing this, but the other thing I would say I think is important is all of the people that get selected to appear on the program, it seems to me, uh, there's a thread of uh, wanting to give back, that, that want to uh, give to their organization that they belong to or to their community or to, um, or to their country. And um, it just seems that, that that's a theme that's throughout there. They're just that kind of person. And, and, you know, when you do that, when you are caring and considerate, gosh, it makes you feel good when you do something for somebody. And I, I was a director of Army Emergency Relief for 11 years, and we provided financial assistance for soldiers and families, interest-free loans and grants. And, and uh, I didn't do all the cases. The cases were done by about well, 200 AER officers around the world. But I got involved in some of the ones when you exceeded authorities and that kind of thing. You know, can we do it or can we not do it? And what a great, uh, it was so gratifying to see uh, how you change, made a change in a family simply because they no longer have that financial burden. It was a short-term cash flow issue and you took care of it. And, and uh, you see how much better they feel about it. Um, you, you know, and I, I'm going on too long, I guess, here. But the, but the point is, uh, uh, there was some hurricane in, um, I don't know, it was Hurricane Andrew. It was a hurricane that existed in the southwest, uh, southeast. And... Um, we um, provided interest-free loans to all of the people who were victims of those, those hunger camps, those soldiers and families. And um, they were very appreciative of it. We were over a million dollars of interest-free loans. And uh, at one point we decided, you know what? These, these soldiers and families, uh, they've lost their, their, uh, their clothing, their furniture, their cars. Let's just convert 
the um, interest-free loans to grants. Don't pay it back. And you know, that was a wonderful thing because again, this, they said, oh, wow, this is great. Now I can go on because I, I don't have any finances to pay. And so my whole point is that theme seems to be in this program. And, and I, I, I commend you for how you put that together. And, and, you, and I don't know if you deliberately go out and look for those kind of folks that do that, but everybody there seems to be doing the same kind of thing. And so I just want to say thanks for your excellent work. I won't say any more. Oh, no, no. It's, it's a pleasure <laughs> having you with us. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today, sir. And uh, thank you for, for kind of, th that theme is very deliberate. And uh, we, we have, what I've learned about doing all these episodes and talking to all these different people, man, it, it's some really good people out there in the world doing some really good stuff. And I know yeah. uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, 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 the clickbait is finding somebody doing something bad and, and everybody kind of zooms in on that. But, uh, you know, sometimes the good gets overshadowed by the negativity. And so uh, I'm glad that we can use this platform to kind of highlight uh, the, the positive folks and, and folks that are serving. And even like you mentioned, Shaquille O'Neal's interview, uh, that's an awesome like rec recruiting uh, interview too, because you know retention rates, you know uh, recruiting is, is is suffering, and and people are trying to yeah. find what what's the goodness of being in the military. And and Shaq probably he probably laid it out there as good as anybody else's. It taught him discipline. He got a chance to uh, learn about resiliency and going from place to place and, and learning different cultures and stuff. And so um, I, I love the platform that they started here uh, at uh, at AFES, and and I'm glad I got a chance to you know be be a, a host of an of a awesome podcast. And I got some awesome teammates, uh, Kiana and Emily and and all the team that, that put this thing together. So thank you for highlighting them. Uh, th this is a great opportunity yeah. to show some love. So appreciate that. All right. <clears throat> so, so can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from? Yes, uh, my wife, Julie, and I live in Old Town, Alexandria, just south of Washington, DC, right alongside the Potomac River. And um, we've been here for 17 years. And uh, Mrs. Foley has told me that uh, that's where we will remain. And I, and I, and I say that, uh, Chief, because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it was about 10 years ago, I guess. And uh, she came to me and she said, I have two pieces of news for you. Now, when she says that, I sit down. Because this is going to be heavy. <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure what she's going to say. Anyway, I sat down on that day. And I said, okay, what's the first piece of news? The first piece of news is we have moved 27 times since we've been married. I said, woo, uh, you know, that's a lot. I, I wasn't calm, but she was. <laughs> 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 and, the, and the thing, and she counted temporary moves. You know how you go to uh, Europe and they, they get designated quarters for you, but they're not ready yet. So you go into temporary quarters for six months. Well, that's a move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it counts. Yeah. Anyway, I said, uh, well, okay, well, what, what's the second piece of news? She said, we're not moving again. <laughs> so, that's all it takes. That's, that's all it takes. That's, that's fine with me. No, and, and we live in a nice area here. You know, uh, Washington, D.C. has got a lot of military, a lot of military support, good hospitals in the area. So we're, we're very comfortable here. So, uh, but, but I always, uh, when, whenever she says something like that, you know, we're not moving again, I, Yes, ma'am. Good with me. Yes, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I learned a long time ago that there's only one general in my house, and it ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it seems to work out. <laughs> And so we're excited to dive in to discussion on your book, Standing Tall, Leadership Lessons in the Life of a Soldier. What inspired you to share your story in memoir form? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question, Emily. I, I tell you, I started out uh, writing an autobiography. Uh, I just thought, you know, it would be something that would be good for family and friends and children and grandchildren. And But as I continued to write and I went through various experiences, <clears throat> I was recalling events and things that happened, and I realized I was so fortunate to have some terrific officers and non-commissioned officers who provided me guidance and mentored me through difficult situations and provided me advice and direction. And I said, you know, why don't I write about those leadership experiences? Because I think they're very important, and it could be educational and, and uh, to different people as they 
as they show what happened. So uh, the, the autobiography got condensed into a memoir that was just on my active duty time. And it was uh, a memoir uh, based on the leadership challenges that I faced during my 37 years on active duty, what I did about those leadership challenges, and um, right or wrong, you know, some people might say, well, I'm not sure that was a good decision, but that's, that's what I determined at that time was the best thing to do. And the lessons I learned along the way. And, and I'll just give you an example of one of the, one of the lessons I learned. Um, the, the, um, the importance of listening. You know, I, I found listening to be a lost art. Uh, we, we just don't, we as leaders especially, don't spend enough time on this business of listening. And, and in my view, after all, you know, the time I spent in the military, I think that uh, regardless of what level it is, from the smallest level to the largest level, whether it's military or corporate CEOs or anybody else, every day, you got to spend time listening, whether we're a squad leader or a brigade command. Every day, carve out time to listen. And I don't mean get a one-hour PowerPoint briefing in your office. That's not what I mean. I mean getting out of your office, getting out of the command center, getting out of the bunker, and going to venues within your organization and, and listening to, to the motor pool, to the training area, to the dining facility, to the, the workspace where the soldiers or employees are there and turn off the, the, the uh, transmit mode. Don't go into train. Just put yourself in the receipt mode. I'm a, I was amazed at the kinds of things I learned when I went out there and just wanted to listen. Just ask questions and sit there with small groups of people and just listen. And you find out things you never would have found out before. You can make changes in policy. Or you find out things from soldiers that say, sir, we don't like this new policy you had. And it turns out it wasn't my policy. <laughs> and I could take care of it and change it. But, you know, sometimes people do that that are, that are uh, um, your subordinates. You know, they don't want to take the blame for it. They just want something done. So they say, well, Colonel Foley said you got to do it. <laughs> you get down and say, that's not my policy. <laughs> so you can straighten things out, you know, it might make sure everything's on a, a stable path. But the other thing, though, I think you do when you do that is you tell soldiers that you really care, that you're interested in what's going on with them. You're interested in, in issues that might come up and you find they're comfortable in coming forward and talking to you because you you might be sitting with them in a foxhole or sitting with them on a snowy day in a motor pool or, or wherever. And um, and and then, uh, you know, sometime when you're not in your listening mode, somebody might just come up and walk up to you and say, sir, I got this great idea. And you know, that's the other thing I found out. Everybody has good ideas, everybody. You just gotta be there to listen and and uh, and get out to the right environment. Anyway, that's uh, that's kind of what I what I talked about. And, and a lot of that is in my. You know. Oh, and sir, you brought up I, a great I, point I, about Shaquille O'Neal's morals and his values and his foundation. And in the book, we not only get glimpses um, into your leadership lessons, but also into who you were in civilian clothes. And um, when I was reading, I noticed that you were really passionate about sports. You looked up to your brother, your father, and you took your religion seriously, even at a young age. So how much of your faith influenced your personal growth from childhood to West Point and beyond? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a great question. My, uh, my faith has uh, been a big, big influence on me. Um, shortly after I was born, <clears throat> I was baptized in the Corpus Christi Catholic Church in Arbordale, Massachusetts. But I never received my first Holy Communion or my confirmation until I was in the ninth grade. And uh, let me tell you how that happened. It was one day, a Saturday afternoon, I was playing basketball with a couple of my friends, Paul Sullivan and Bill Callahan. And uh, it got to be about four o'clock. And I said, okay, we got to go to a confession. Now, I did at that time what I had been doing all the way through elementary school because I'd never been to confession before. I didn't know what it was all about. I just said, well, I, I'm sorry, I got to go home. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not going to go with you. But on that day, I didn't go home. I walked directly to the rectory at Our Lady of Mercy Catholic Church in Belmont, Massachusetts. I rang the doorbell and the housekeeper came and I said, I'd like to talk to a priest. Now, 
I don't think I would have, I was a shy 15 year old lad. I don't think I would have done that by myself. There was a higher authority propelling me down the sidewalk to the rectory. And, and uh, anyway, when I, uh, Monsignor Griffin <clears throat> was at uh, home at the time and he said, uh, well, come on in. And so I told him my, you know, my situation and he said, well, we can take care of that easy. He said, no, but you're gonna have to go to catechism classes with the elementary school students because that's when they got their first Holy Communion confirmation. And I said, let me, check it with your parents, and I think we can make that happen. Well, we did, and that's what I did. I went to catechism classes with the elementary school students, and it looked a little strange because I was six foot five in the ninth grade, <laughs> and I, I towered over my fellow students, but I had my mindset. I was gonna get my first Holy Communion, I was gonna get my confirmation, and what a difference it made what peace of mind I had because I was able to go to confession with my friends. I received communion on, and went to Sunday mass. I mean, I just felt a whole person now. I, and, and plus, you know, I, I was able to understand the scriptures and read the scriptures and know things. And, and, um, and the other thing that, that came out of that, it was from that day forward, I believed in, the, uh, I became a great believer in the power of prayer. And, and still do, and all through my life, I have I have um, been involved in in keeping the faith. And and even though times are tough, if you keep the faith, you know, as you know, it's like old Job <clears throat> in the Bible. I mean, he lost everything. He lost his wealth, his health, his family, everything. But he kept his faith. And so I've always felt that. You see, one of my chapters is keep the faith. And I was struggling when I was a player at West Point, but I kept the faith. And that's another time I went to daily mass, you know, when I was uh, at, at West Point and, and it made me feel good. And I, I really felt that God's presence was there making sure I graduated. And uh, as you know, in the book, I, I didn't graduate that high in my class. <laughs> <laughs> hey, neither did I, neither did I, cause uh, you know, I started off as a Marine. So my ASVAB score wasn't that high uh, co coming, coming in, but. But it's all about personality in there, right? <laughs> right yeah. But uh, no, but it was. Uh, I'm. I'm just glad that um, that you know. You never know uh, exactly what God wants you to do. You pray for certain things. You're not sure what He wants you to do, or He might want you to do it, but not now. Might want to be later on. But if you keep the faith, everything works out fine. Yes. And and sir, your faith was a was a strong foundation for you. And kind of to go back to the point you made about listening as a leadership skill. Um, I was at Columbus Air Force Base um, a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to uh, one, the Colonel there. He was uh, the vice commander or deputy commander there. And he, he said his dad was a, a retired chief mass sergeant. And he told him this piece of advice when he came into the military, he said, never miss your opportunity to shut up. And so I, I, I had <laughs> never heard it, put, <laughs> I had never heard it put that way. <laughs> but I was like, you know what, sir, I'm going to steal that and I'm going to, I'm going to pass that on to the next generation. So, um, that's going to be in my toolbox from now on as, as, I, as I'm mentoring folks coming up to never miss out on the opportunity to shut up. Yeah. You know, my, my oldest son was at Columbus Air Force Base. He, he was, he went to the Air Force Academy. And so he was okay. in flight training. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And he invited me to come over to a briefing he had to give to the squadron or the flight squadron or whatever one day and he uh, anyway he put up these uh, cartoon characters and and uh, the first one was a soldier in a rainstorm and he was soaking wet and he was standing there with all his gear and his rifle and he said this really stinks and then the next one showed him in a snowstorm he was freezing and chattering and he said this really stinks and the next one showed him um in the desert sweat pouring off his face still had a rucksack and ammunition and everything hanging off of me. This really stinks. And then the last caption was an Air Force officer who was in the, D, the BOQ and he had the remote control in his hand and he said, what? No cable? This really stinks. <laughs> he, he, he was trying to show the difference between the Army and the Air Force. <laughs> so I always yeah, remember yeah. that. So I, I know Chief Master and you're very comfortable. Oh yeah, yeah. Listen, I, my, my job doesn't suck, sir. I can tell you that. 
<laughs> but, but but I, I love I love to play on words uh, with with your title of your book, uh, Standing Tall, because um, like you said, you were six foot five in the ninth grade, and and I, I'm assuming you grew a couple a couple of inches before you got to the 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 academy or West Point, and so you yeah. you had to be probably the tallest cadet at Beast Barracks, um, and and we heard the story about you them not having any shoes that that fit you, and so you kind of you walked around with you know your size 16 you had just some i think you you had some dress shoes for like the first I did. Well, they, uh, they told us to get uh black dress shoes to take them with you for that you know that first day of uh, beast barracks so you have shoes absolutely and so it took them a while to get that and so how, how did you you know keep your faith in, in west point as as you're, you're trying to maneuver and do all the stuff that you got to do as a cadet without any shoes those six days were really difficult um, because, um, it, you know, after the first day, all of my classmates, they got uh, sneakers and boots and, and shower clogs and they, you know, they got everything they were supposed to have. And I didn't. So I wore to uh, when we went out in the early morning to do um, physical training and they had mud and grass and everything out there. Um, the, my classmates came back and threw their sneakers down and picked up their spit polished shoes and walk out to formation meanwhile i'm trying to clean the mud and grass off my shoes uh you know to get out in the formation and all i heard was mr foley those are the grossest shoes i've ever seen get your neck in i mean that's all they did was yell at me fortunately uh the uh comment on a cadets um, you know, he, he came and saw that i had this difficulty and my squad leader was uh, a uh, basketball player he was a senior on the team on the basketball team so he had an intense interest in making sure i was going to get taken care of so we went through the company tactical officer anyway they got shoes from fort bragg north carolina and they came in six days afterwards and what a difference it made i had i had my boots my shoes my shower clogs everything i needed and um it, it really changed things around it um, i i was uh, really happy to be able to be like everybody else at that point in time I even had to wear those dress shoes to a shower formation. Everybody wearing shower cloth. Ooh, and I remember one of my one of my classmates stepped back in the line and stepped right down on my spit shine shoes. So oh, it was tough. Yeah, I can imagine a six foot seven cadet sliding across the the, the floor in some dress shoes, uh, trying to do PT like that. That's a visual that I can't get out of my head right now. <laughs> well, fortunately, General Throckmorton, who was the uh, commandant of cadets, he was the one who saw that and he immediately got got some. Uh, and I never forgot that. That was a lesson learned. But uh, just what I was talking about before, you get out and find out what issues are out there and you can solve them, you know, for one person or for groups or policy changes. But he wanted to see for himself. And as soon as he did, he, uh, he got it done. So, uh, absolutely. And you received several offers to play basketball on the collegiate level. At West Point, you were voted team captain by your peers and played against ball players who ended up in the NBA. I would like to hear some names on that one, actually, if you don't mind. I'm a huge NBA fan. Um, but what was it about basketball that you enjoyed so much? And do you ever wish you had tried to make a career out of it? Um, yeah, well, it was, um, yeah, I was very fortunate. <clears throat> I had a lot of, uh, basketball scholarships and, um, they were full scholarships and I, uh, scholarship offers. And I, um, I didn't do anything until the end of the, my basketball season in high school. And then I decided that the best way to find out if I want to go to those schools was to take a trip. And so I took a trip to the Citadel, uh, to Providence college which is a nice Catholic school, the Holy Cross, another Catholic school. And the fourth one I went to was to the military academy. And uh, as soon as I came back from the military academy, I knew where I wanted to go to college. Now, uh, I, I knew I wanted to go to West Point. And now um, my high school basketball coach, Coach Mel Winter, um, he had a different view on that. He felt that I was good enough to play professional basketball. And so 
he told me, he said, now, look, if you choose West Point, you're going to be making two decisions. One is where to go to college, and two is never to play professional basketball. And he was basing that on the fact that um, there's a five-year commitment as a commission officer when you're not going to be able to play any basketball. You can be out there with your soldiers. And so, and, and professional teams aren't interested in taking somebody who's been five years away from basketball. They're going to take the next ones coming out of college. And um, so, you know, I think he was right about that. Um, and and I, frankly, I, I never I never really looked back, and I never thought about it that much until uh, the summer of 1963, when uh, I looked at my first military pay voucher, which was in July of 1963. And I looked, my my basic pay was $222.30 a month. That's $2,667 annual salary. And I sat there thinking, you know, I'll bet you professional basketball players make a little bit more than $2,667 a month. <laughs> but I never regretted my decision. I've enjoyed the leadership responsibilities I've had in, in the United States Army. I've enjoyed the camaraderie. And, uh, and frankly, I've enjoyed the sense of purpose I had as a, a being a member of our U.S. Armed Forces. Now, so speaking of your leadership experiences, um, the sorry chick story, I've called it the sorry chick story, <laughs> but it's one that stood out to me while reading your book. So when you were leading a group of men across a body of water, you first tested out your ID on yourself. So you walked out and you're like, okay, the water comes across like my chest area. So this will be good for, you know, everyone else, except for chick who was only five, six. So after seeing him cross entirely underwater, why was it important for you to acknowledge what happened to him? And then how did your ability to empathize and show compassion even in your first leadership experiences allow you um, to continue to grow and progress as a strong leader in the Army? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, let me just say that um, th this event uh, occurred during Ranger School. And Ranger School was the very best training I had received in the United States Army, especially for uh, a young uh, uh, officer, you know, for lieutenants and captains. I mean, it was it was absolutely superb, and it wasn't it wasn't just the tactical concepts that you learned. It was uh, you learned a lot about yourself, and it was um, very physically and mentally demanding. Uh, we were crossing the mountains of Georgia, the uh, swamps of Florida, with little or no sleep. But one of the key things that I learned was uh, I acquired a great skill and proficiency in the use of map and compass. And, you know, people say, well, why is that so important today? But in, in the 1960s, there was no thing as, such thing as the global positioning system. The GPS didn't exist yet. So to get from point A to point B, you, you had to use a map and compass. And, and from if, from the uh, infantry officer basic course, we had three patrols in the infantry officer basic course. And for whatever reason, on the first patrol, I was designated point man. And a point man is the uh, soldier that goes out two or 300 yards in front of the patrol so that they can radio back to the patrol leader about enemy sightings or obstacles in their path. And um, so you have to do your own map and compass work, and and um, and and that's what I did. And so I, but I did apparently I did such a good job on that first patrol that the second patrol they said, hey Foley, that's the guy he know, put him in there. So for all three patrols in the infantry officer basic course, I was a point man. And then in ranger school, for every patrol we had, I was a point man, just automatic Foley, other point man. And, uh, you know, as I said, I especially, I, did, I, I guess I did a good job. But um, the only thing about appointment, in addition to, you know, the map and compass, sometimes at night, you'd be the first one to find the 10 foot drop that you're running into. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so <laughs> when you when you get up from the 10 foot drop, you could radio back to the patrol. Lead, Don't come this way. <laughs> so, but. It it, um, it 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 was a a um, a proficiency that I found absolutely essential as a rifle company commander in Vietnam. 
because even though I had people did map and compass work, when you're moving through enemy territory at night, you're going to make sure you're doing a, you're going the right way and you're doing the right thing and, and you're going to get the right support and you're going to meet up with the right people and you know, so forth. So anyway, that, that range of school was one of the best experiences I had to prepare me to lead soldiers. So, and I did want to follow yes, up with you because out the book, we talked a bit about just your, your humility. So when you didn't have shoes, um, you didn't complain about it. You kind of stepped into that role and said, I'm going to do what I have to do until I can get where I want to be. Um, and there were a few other instances and experiences you had during your time at West Point where maybe you didn't make the best choices, like with the fellas and the situation with the alcohol or whatever, but you never um, took upon yourself to be like, I don't know, I guess a little bit more brazen about it. Like, oh, I wish this would happen for me and this would happen. You were so humble. I think that's also why so many people like you, especially when it comes to basketball and your peers just really enjoying you and your personality. And you had such a great leadership style. So I just wanted to chime in with that. But also what made you such a nice person? Because that's, I don't want to say it's not normal to be nice, but you are naturally such a kind and loving person. So what kind of inspired that? I wish my wife were here to listen to that. <laughs> I, I, I hope she, I'm going to make sure. Now, the, I can get this video next week, right? She can hear it because that's good. I'm going to go and tell her that. Because, uh, you know, no, sometimes no, we, I wish she can hear right I now. Sir. The, what? I, I said we can get you that video right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to tell her I want because I want her to hear what Jenna said. That's, uh, you know, because sometimes I wake up in the morning, you know, and I'm filled with self-esteem ready to go and by five o'clock at night my self-esteem is gone you know, miss foley doesn't hold back any punches she's tough on me no she's <laughs> wonderful we've been married 53 years and um I, we can't wait for the next 53. it's, it's been wonderful we, we we've enjoyed every moment and uh, I, I i say we're blessed because we uh we found the right did, did you happen to read about how we met in the in the book didn't, didn't read about that. Yes, no, anything else about her. I love Julie because she is such a, <laughs> this is how it is, this is how it's going to be kind of person. And you, I love that you said that she's the same way about you moving now, but she was like, are we getting married or what? Like, where's this going, <laughs> sir? Let's do it at this spot. <laughs> I know, I took some well, notes from that too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> She's having a bad influence on you already. This is really important. <laughs> well, Chief, what we're talking about is um, when we were dating, I asked her twice to marry me. And then I went off to Fort Knox. She stayed in Washington, D.C., you know. So um, I thought it was over. And uh, she finally called me on the phone. And uh, I was on my way to class. I was take, going to my school before I went to West Point to be a company tactical officer. And uh, so she called me and, and she, uh, so I said, hey, and, and I was staying with my friend and my friend got the call. And so he said, you need to call her back. So a couple of days later, I called her back and I said, uh, hey, uh, Ed Myers, I was staying with him. I said, Ed said to call you, what do you want? Because, I, you know, I mean, I'd lost track of her and everything. So she said, she said, well, I just wanted to talk to you and find out how you're doing. I haven't talked to you in a long time. And you know, I said, okay, Julie, I said, but you know, I, I'm getting to go to school here. I need to know what you want. Because I said, well, I just want to talk to you. I said, seriously, Julie, what do you want? She said, I want to get married. I said, to who? <laughs> you know, I figured it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, she proposed over the phone, and I said, yes. What can I say? <laughs> I love, I, that, that was one of my favorite parts. I loved that. I'm, like, tearing up because I just loved it so much. <laughs> It was so yeah. good. Well, I didn't say yes right away. I said, I'll tell you what, uh, let me think about it. I'll get down, uh, down to Washington, D.C. We'll visit. We'll talk about it. And, and that was it. Well, I guess I found out I loved him more than I thought. And so, uh, yeah, that's another thing that that's another thing that God did. He, he, he put us together and said, okay, now it's time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. time before. Now it's time for you to get the married. I said, oh, okay, I got it now. <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, your question Keon. <laughs> but I appreciate the compliments, but um, anyway, I had to I had to put that story in because it's uh, it's a very important part of my life. I mean, you know, you talk about the uh, people ask me, so what, what was the major point in your life? What was the most important part of your life? Marrying Julie. The most important by far. 
She has helped me all along the way, given me great advice, taking care of my family and children when I was deployed. Uh, and, and, and now we have children out there and grandchildren that are all doing well. And that's why I say I feel blessed. So did I answer the question? I don't know if I did or not. We just talked oh, about absolutely. it. It's okay. Well, Julie has a lot of influence on you. We learned that. So that's good. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. And, and, and sir, you, 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 you kind of reinforced that point, man. It, we, we, everybody says thank you for our sacrifice and our service, but man, our families sacrifice probably far more than we do to be honest with you because uh because we're off especially you know you're familiar with it um i'm tdy all the play all over the place and uh i got three boys at home and a grandson and uh mm -hmm. you know my, my wife is a very very important part of 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 making sure the house is is going in the direction that it needs to go in and so yeah. you know I, I come in and i drop off a suitcase and i pick up another suitcase and leave and and she rolls her eyes at me because uh you know, I'm at all these cool, nice locations. So I don't, I don't, I don't post anything on Facebook or I don't take any selfies or stuff. So, so she won't feel jealous or nothing, but, but, uh, it's, <laughs> it's super important that that family, man, family without family, man, it's, it's, it's a hard well, road to travel. You know and chief, the other thing that, that, that I tried to bring out there in a couple of the chapters was, uh, not only that, but the kinds of things that, uh, spouses do for uh, the organization. You know, you're out doing all the tactical techniques and everything, but they're arranging the social events. They're arranging all of the um, uh, things that take care of family, especially when you're overseas and uh, making sure that the, the families are taken care of, that there are problems. I mean, they're out there talking about those things. They're doing the, the social events. They're uh, doing fundraising. And, uh, and I tried to bring that out because uh, Julie was very actively involved in getting all the other spouses involved so they all could contribute. And there was also a sense of family, you know, and she would do that. I remember one time she, she uh, brought, had all the first sergeant's uh, wives over for lunch one day at, at our quarters when I was a battalion commander. And I was gone somewhere, I don't know where. And so she said, you know, what's, a, what's something that you'd like to do that we could all do? And they said, well, we don't go shopping much. Well, the next thing I knew, there was a caravan of the biggest cars they could get, and off they went to the to the um, uh, pottery factories and to the rug factories and all this. And you know, and uh, of several of the first sergeants came back and said, "Hey, sir, your wife's costing us a lot of money." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, you need to do that, especially when you're overseas. That's the only time you're going to have a chance oh, yeah. to do stuff. Like that. So absolutely, absolutely, and and. Big shout out to Julie and big shout out to Katrina, my wife, uh, you know, for, yeah. for holding us down for all these years. Uh, and, and like you said, sir, we, you know, they, they bring, they're, they're just as much of, of the military family as the unit, as, as us, as, as military members. And they bring Absolutely. everybody together. And, and my boss, uh, Mr. Tom Show, he always says, uh, you know, AFES, we're, we're, we're set up to, to take care of family too. So if you, you take care of my family, and then I'll I'll be ready to to do whatever the mission calls, and he he speaks about that all the time about what what his father uh, said. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so you also have a, a bunch of uh, credos and mantras that stood out uh, to you in your West Point days. Uh, you were inspired by Robert Frost, uh, "The Road Less Traveled." Uh, the West Point Superintendent Major General Davidson, his remarks, uh, "Pursue quality and all you do, no matter how big or how small," and also the West Point motto of "Duty, Honor, and Country." Uh, how important is it to have words to live by when pursuing goals and leading others? Yeah, you know that really is a great question, um, uh, Chief Master, because uh, I th I think it's not only very important, but I think it's essential. You know, in the Army we have um, a uh, an acronym called leadership, and it stands for loyalty, duty, and respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And it's not that you just you rattle off those names. Is th 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 those values are meant to be instilled in every individual soldier, and so they understand what each means and what their responsibilities are in regard to those values, and they're also meant to be instilled in the uh, in the unit culture, and, uh, <clears throat> and so that uh, those values become a very important part of, of of the Army way of life, and I think we're also fortunate around forces because we have what I refer to as the officer NCO team. And, and in the Army, it's the, uh, the platoon leader, uh, platoon sergeant, company commander, first sergeant, battalion commander, sergeant major, all the way up to chief of staff of the Army and sergeant major. 
we've got that officer, non-commissioned officer team. And, and they're the moral conscience of the organization. They're the ones responsible for ensuring uh, the strength of character of their organization, for instilling the right values in the organization. And I mean on a continual basis, not just one that I, and I don't mean that, you know, you just have to have a class on it, you know, I mean just doing it by being out there and setting the example, and making sure those values get emphasized. Because our soldiers are on point every day, whether it's peacetime or wartime. They're on point uh, for, for their organization, for the army, sometimes for the nation. And, and we have to ensure that they're instilled with the right values because when they face a difficult situation, we want to make the right decision. And, and, I, and I've always said, you know, the, the, the strength of character that we need to have in, in, a, in time of war doesn't automatically show up on the battlefield. Those values have to be instilled long before we get our deployment orders. If you wait for pre-deployment training to start instilling values, you've lost it. It can't happen. So, uh, so I think words to live by, absolutely important. So I believe it started in, I think, chapter six, um, Vietnam War, and you made it, um, I think it was the the first or second sentence, you you shared that you were not anxious um, going over um, to Southeast Asia. So, which I would be terrified. <laughs> so, but can you take us back to the first moment you arrived in Vietnam? And so what was your mindset going into war? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't, what, what part was that you said that I... I so I, chapter I was, six. In 1996, yeah. the buildup of the American forces in Vietnam, you never felt anxious about deploying to Southeast Asia, nor did my junior officer friends. Right. That's right. I never felt anxious about it all. Yeah. I, didn't, I mean, yeah. well, because it was, it was duty on our country. I mean, it was supposed to, that's the thing we we're supposed to do. And it was a war going on. And, and we had a lot of people that, that were going over there on other missions. And uh, so we eventually thought that that was going to happen. And of course, the whole 25th Infantry Division you know, finally went. Uh, they, um, they, they deployed over there. So, uh, well, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> it, it, it was it's really a, um, uh, a very, um, I don't know, it's not maybe a, an exciting kind of thing to say, but it, it's, uh, I was the um, heavy mortar platoon leader for the 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry. And uh, my job was to ensure that I took care of the soldiers. I had 40 soldiers in my platoon, five non-commissioned officers, and uh, we were responsible for uh, providing effective uh, and timely and accurate uh, fire uh, support to the line companies. And, uh, and that was my focus. I, I wanted to ensure that uh, our readiness standards were up, up to what they should be and that uh, we were proficient and everybody knew their jobs. And, uh, and I, there was an expression that I've always learned since I was a brand new second lieutenant. It was called, stay in your lane. And so that's what I did. My focus was totally on that platoon. And I a, lot, a lot of some, sometimes leaders get, leaders get um, distracted from things, you know, and, and some people like to be involved in the geostrategic implications of the war in Vietnam. Well, I, I want to be right here focused on my troops, focused on my mission, and because you have plenty to do, and you got to remember, the enemy's all out there. They're all around you, and you, you've got to make sure you do that. So stay in your lane, I found to be excellent advice. So that's kind of what was on my mind as I, as I uh, went in there, and I think uh, it proved itself to be, to be helpful to me and to my platoon. I still stay in my lane today, especially when I'm at home with Ms. Cole. <laughs> I was going to say, I, th I think you are told to stay in your lane. <laughs> oh, man, there's no question about it. You know, you, I don't know about you, but for, <laughs> Mass, Chief Master, I don't know about you, but when I come home, I have to sit down and say what happened. I don't get to do anything else until the whole day goes down and, I'm, and I've got it all out. I mean, I, don't, I, I can't go for a run, nothing. Sit down. What happened today? <laughs> oh yeah, well, sir, sir, mine's a little bit the opposite. Uh, I'm in, I'm in receive mode, so I, I never miss out on the opportunity <laughs> to shut up at home. 
So, 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 so I, I go home. I go home, sit up, and 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 turn on the the, the receive mode. <laughs> That's good. In other words, you got to hear her day first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, mine comes later. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. Uh, now, sir, and your leadership in Vietnam um, afforded you the Medal of Honor. Um, so in your book, you talk about Operation Attleboro, but what were your observations of your men, the enemy, and how did that experience influence your leadership throughout your military career? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, um, the... Um, even, even before I was on Operation Edelboro, um, especially as a rifle company commander, I used to ask myself this question. What is it that motivates these great soldiers every day uh, to go out uh, on combat assaults, uh, search and destroy missions, uh, stay behind ambushes, um, to serve as a tunnel rat? And, uh, you know, a tunnel rat in those days were the, were the soldiers that whenever you found a tunnel, they were the ones who got a 45 caliber pistol and a flashlight. And that's all they had on. They went down inside a tunnel and knowing that there might be a booby trap or there might be Viet Cong inside the tunnel that were gonna shoot at them, but they did it anyway. I never ran out of volunteers. When the call went out for a tunnel rat, the soldiers came running up and said, sir, I got this one. And, and um, so, you know, I, I, intuitively, you know that this motivation comes from the the, uh, the discipline, the, the training, the leadership, the education. But I found the most compelling motivation uh, for soldiers to do it, to do what they have to do was this um, sincere intent and, and sincere regard that they had. This intense regard that they had for their fellow soldiers. They would do anything to prevent their fellow soldiers from being killed or wounded. These were their buddies, their friends, their comrades in arms. There was an unwritten creed in Vietnam when I was there, and as I will not let my buddy down. So to me, it was a combat multiplier. I mean, you, you, you got soldiers doing that all the time. You know, I leveraged that. That was a wonderful thing. And, and today it's called treating people with respect and dignity, being caring and conservative. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful value. If you have that in your organization, you're going to have a healthy, healthy organization. And so I learned from that day forward that what I did in every single command I was in was I ensured that I instilled the kind of trust and cohesion and camaraderie that would lead to a positive command climate every single day. And you know, a positive command climate doesn't just show up every morning in your organization or in your headquarters. You know, we create it, and we leaders have to be a part of that. And so uh, if you do that on a continual basis, I think you end up with a kind of organization where people are happy with what they're doing, they're productive, they're reaching out in a way of, you know, in, in a synergistic way to help out one another, and you have that teamwork on a continual basis. So uh, that, that, that's the kind of thing which was, um, well, it really came true when I when I watch these soldiers, um, I mean, they were fighting together, living together. It's, uh, there is a special bond that's established that's very, very powerful. Oh, absolutely, sir. Oh, um, and I thought about the same thing when you were talking about um, just wanting to do things for your 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 teammates. And like you said, we we train together, we we work together every day. And then when you're in the thick of it and when you're in the like most intense moments of your life and you got your your, your battle buddy or your wingman or or, or or your fellow Marine or man, it's you, you don't want to let that person down. Like uh, in the Marines, we always talk about, you know, you got my six. And so it's all about right. always covering somebody six uh, in, in the foxhole. So, man, it, it's a it's it's awesome that you're just dropping all these leadership jewels that that really kind of stand the test of time because um you know, no matter, you know, when you when you serve, there's some like core principles in, of leadership that, that just that just continue to work no matter what generation is 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 following. So uh, thank you for those for those yeah. nuggets uh, that you're dropping it today. And also, I kind of wanted to talk about the, the Medal of Honor uh, ceremony uh, where 
President Johnson conferred the medal uh, to you for your her heroic leadership in Vietnam. So can you kind of share your memory of that day? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, it was a ceremony both for myself and for uh, Sergeant John Baker. Uh, Sergeant Baker was um, a uh, specialist fourth class uh, in my company at the time of the action. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story about him because he, um, two weeks before the action, he was across the street in Coochie where our base camp was. And uh, he, he was a cannoneer for an artillery battery. He walked across the street and talked to my first sergeant, first sergeant Fulgham, and said, uh, first sergeant, I want to get out and see some action. I, I, I'm tired of being standing back here and being a cannoneer. And, you know, I, we fire the rounds and we never know anything, never see anything. Well, the two first sergeants worked it out. And anyway, he came, he was, he was in a company. And um, I remember telling him, <laughs> Every time I saw him after that, I said, John, did you get enough action? <laughs> because he got the Medal of Honor on the same day, <clears throat> and uh, it was uh, 1 May 1968. The action took place on 5 November 1966. And um, I received uh, a Silver Star, as did uh, uh, John Baker, for the action in the field. <clears throat> Excuse me, from General G.G. O'Connor, the acting division commander of the 25th Infantry Division. And so I thought it was over with. I, I went back to the uh, Fort Belvoir, the engineer school. I was an instructor, and um, and I didn't think about anything else until shortly before the 1st of May, sometime in April, when my classmate, Jay Westermeyer, was working in the Pentagon Awards Decorations Branch. He said, I got to come see you. <clears throat> so I said, OK, kind of fine. I was living in Washington, D.C., and um, he said, um, President Johnson is going to uh, present you with the Medal of Honor on 1 May 1968. I mean, I was stunned. I said, well, nobody said anything about it. You know? and, uh, so anyway, 1 May 1968 came, and and uh, my parents were flown in from, uh, they were living in Florida, and uh, we, uh, for two days before the ceremony, and we stayed in the Madison Hotel right downtown. <laughs> and uh, we had Army officers and NCOs that were our escorts. I had two non-commissioned officers that came and grabbed my uniform, Took everything off it, all the brass, all the decorations, got it out, pressed and clean, brought it back, put all the decorations back on with a ruler. I mean, every mm -hmm. single one had a ruler getting all the Everybody was checking everybody. I mean, said, man, this, nothing will be wrong with this uniform. I can see that. Anyway, the day came and uh, we, we uh, went outside uh, the day of the ceremony, and outside was a big limousine, uh, two police cars, about six police motorcycles. And off we took with um, blue lights flashing and sirens wailing and onto the White House. Uh, my dad was um, in the back seat with my mother and my, and my mom and me. And uh, he got a little bit emotional about the whole thing. But, um, you know, it was kind of an emotional experience. And we went uh, directly to the White House. We were escorted up to the Red Room where we met uh, General Harold K. Johnson, the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Earl G. Wheeler, who was the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the President. And um, uh, Sergeant Baker's uh, mother and father were there. And uh, the ceremony was to be in the, uh, in the East Room of the White House where uh, other friends and guests had been invited, plus soldiers that served with me in the 7th and in the 25th Infantry Division. They were also invited. Uh, they were all going to be in the uh, East Room. And so when everybody went in, we left with the president, uh, Sergeant Baker, and me, and we walked in to the East Room while they played Hail to the Chief. That's the first time that I really started getting a little nervous. I said, man, where am I? What, <laughs> what am I doing here? I, kind of, I think I'd rather be in Vietnam getting shot at right now <laughs> than, than being right here. This is an intimidating thing. And I thought that was bad and, but until I finally got to the uh, platform, <clears throat> I, I turned turned around, did an about face, and it seemed like 100, there's probably 30 or 40. Cameras went off with flash bulbs, flashing and flashing. You know, it was the, it was the White House press pool there. And, and I saw all that, and then I saw in the front row, senior leaders, general officers, sergeants major, uh, my family and friends and soldiers from the unit, and um, fortunately, the uh, ceremony itself was very short. The president made introductory remarks. He um, 
the, the citations were read. Um, the um, uh, president placed the uh, medals around my neck and, and Sergeant Baker's necks. And we were told not to have a conversation with the president. We said to say four words. Thank you, Mr. President. That was it. <laughs> no more discussion. We're, anything else is no script for this. This is you. You know, there's no time to carry on discussion. Go, okay, yes, sir, I got it. Anyway, and then, um, and then as soon as it was over, we we uh, everybody left, and we were able to in the foyer of the White House outside the East Room, got a chance to meet with with uh, just sound bites really but a chance to meet with the family friends soldiers that were there and then later on we had a, a luncheon and the soldiers were all there and so i got a chance to spend a little bit more time with him and one of the great visuals i had is uh, i was watching my high school coach who meant so much to me and my college basketball coach who not only taught me about the skills of basketball but about the values of life that are important about winning and aggressiveness and toughness and, and and uh, they was talking to one another. And I said, that's really neat to see that happen and come together. <laughs> and so um, anyway, that was, um, <clears throat> that was, you know, and I, I kind of, I'm going off on a different tangent here, but that's the kind of thing which is great about our armed forces. It's one big family. You know, you get back together, even, even after you retire, it's, it's still a family. You just feel like the family. You know, I'm, I'm going out now to some of these, uh, um, book signing events, you know, and I run into people I haven't seen forever, and they tell me, you know, "Sir, I serve for you in this in this thing here." And so it's it's again, it's like the big family. It's very important. Anyway, that's sort of what happened uh, on the day of the ceremony at the White House. And sir, I'd like to turn to our live feed. Um, we have a lot of comments and questions in our chat right now. Um, so the first one comes from Tim Meyer. Uh, he says, thank you for your service to our country, sir. Since you're an author, what books have inspired you? Yeah, that's that's very good. Um, well, uh, I'll tell you, the um, one of the ones that I read a long time ago and uh, I'm still reading is, um, I, I just read again completely, is uh, Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book about um, different leadership styles and, uh, and what people did. And uh, it's, a, it's a fiction book, but the author had spent a lot of time in World War I and World War II. And so it, it captures the essence of, of, the, uh, of the kind of uh, things they did. Um, gee, there's so many other books out there that uh, inspire me. Um, there's a, a book um, called... Um, uh reagan at rocky back rocky back rocky back rocky back anyway this was when uh president reagan and, and president gorbachev met in rocky back to discuss about uh the reduction of uh arms reduction nuclear weapons and it was a it was a fascinating book it was written by a gentleman named edelman who was the arms director for the for president reagan and uh it was very inspirational to see how president reagan worked so hard to uh, reduce the nuclear weapons capability that we had and how he and Gorbachev became very, very close in, in doing that. And, and that's the only way that actually they could get things done in the summits that occurred after the Reagan, the Reykjavik uh, summit, because they spent time alone together discussing what was important. And what happened was they got to know each other. And all of a sudden, this word that's so important in any organization trust started getting in there they trusted one another implicitly about uh, about what was uh, what was about to happen and so they said if they do that and they sign it and they sign these agreements which they did later on at other summits but it really uh, laid the groundwork for ending the cold war <clears throat> uh, at, at Reykjavik so that was inspirational and there's a whole host of other ones that I have but um, those are two that I think of up front Thank you so much. And um, Julie is saying, what a wonderful opportunity to hear from a hero. What led you to write this book now? Okay, well, 
Um, it, it's it's actually a, a, an interesting question because um, when I was on active duty, there would be times when people would say, I'd, I'd tell a story. And it wasn't just a you know, funny anecdote or anything, but it was about something that happened. And, and after I described it, I would have people say to me, say, you're interested in writing a book? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe someday. And uh, But I just never had time on active duty to sit down and do it. But um, the, the last time when I really thought seriously about it was when the book um, called Above and Beyond, it's about Medal of Honor recipients, and it was uh, there's a synopsis of each Medal of Honor recipient, and, um, and then there's uh, photos of, of us. And uh, it was written by Peter Collier. He was an author who's written a lot of things, and he wrote up these synopses, of just a short uh, version of the, the Medal of Honor recipient's life. And when he finished talking to me, it was a telephonic interview. He said, you know, you really ought to write a book. You've got some interesting things that I think would be very valuable. So anyway, I, um, I finally retired from being director of Army Emergency Relief in December of 2016. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, I uh, is probably about the spring of 2017. I decided, well, why don't I just take everything that I can remember, now that I can still remember it, and put it into the computer <laughs> in, in the way of being an autobiography. You know, I was born on 30 May 1941 and go from there. And, uh, and I asked a few people, I said, how do you do that? How do you write a book? What do you do? Do you write an outline? I mean, what do you do? And there was one um, uh, friend of mine who was a high school classmate of mine. She had written a book. And I asked her, I said, what did you do? And she said, just start writing. <laughs> so I did. I, I just started writing and I got up to about 140,000 words. And then I had uh, some other people uh, that um, were, were good advisors. And one of them, wh who's, um, his name is Sean Desmond. He's, um, he works for, uh, well, he's an editor with um, Grand Central Publishing, which is a subsidiary of Hachette uh, Publishing Group. And uh, he told me 80,000 words. Don't go beyond 80,000 words. That, that's, that's enough. People are going to lose, you know, uh, interest after that. Just, just make it, you know, go to it. And so that's, that's where my book happened to come out to be about 80,000 words. Because he told me you can't write about everything. You just got to write about what you think about. It. So anyway, that, that's, that's sort of how I, I started off and what I did in writing. And by the way, I have to tell you, I really enjoyed writing the book. I guess I found out I liked to write. And, and I really liked doing it. I, and, and when I get, I read a, a couple of books. Uh, one is a, um, the called uh, by William Zinser about um, writing well. And, um, you know, he, he mentioned that as you go through it, you might see words that, that, that are the right words to use in a sentence but they don't capture the rhythm and, and the flow that you'd like to have in that sentence. And so uh, they said one of the best ways to, to really check on that is to do out loud reading. And my, my lovely wife, Julie, has, was on the, she's been the victim of a lot of out loud reading. And I'm glad I did that with her because um, as, as you probably uh, determined, she didn't hold back any punches. There were entire chapters that I wrote, did out loud reading, and she said, I don't understand any of that. I think you better delete it. I, mean, I said, well, if you don't understand it, nobody's going to understand it. So, I mean, I guess I will. I guess throw it up, you know. But anyway, I found joy in, in, in getting the flow and the rhythm of the sentences and the paragraphs and feeling good about that. Even though they, they didn't, I had to use other words, but it, so word uses became very important. And, and I just got excited about trying to write the right words to convey the right message and to say the right things. And, and, um, and so, you know, that was, that, that was very important. And, and it was also important part was, um, you may have seen at the end where I had acknowledgements I tried to acknowledge all those people who had been my mentors because, and, and indicate why, and what they did and what they'd done for me. And, and uh, so that, um, that was another very important. So you, you see, I had a lot of mentors. You know why? I needed a lot of help. I really did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> me too, they sir. saw me walking down the hallway and said, oh God, 
Lieutenant Foley, come in here. Sit down. Let me talk to you. <laughs> and so my it was really funny because would be very long too. <laughs> What? My my acknowledgement page would be very long too if I were to ever write a book. <laughs> so yeah, I understand. Yeah. And sometimes I, I have, you know, especially when I came a general officer, you know, I'd have I'd be with general officers and they'd be complaining about things that I did. I said, wait a minute, you all trained me. I'm sorry. If you're not happy with it, what you got, <laughs> you should have left me alone. Sure, guy, you're my mentors and here you're complaining about what I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this is good. <laughs> I love that. So, sir, after Vietnam, you went on to attend additional military schools, including the U.S. Naval War College. And we were also assigned to military bases across the country and in Europe, completing your military career in the year 2000 as commanding general of the 5th United States Army at Fort Sam Houston. Such an amazing career. What is your best advice to aspiring and upcoming military leaders? Yeah, no, that's good. That's uh, that's an opportunity for me to give back in, in, in a way, in a mentorship role. And I will tell you, the first and probably the only thing that comes to my mind is the importance of professional reading. And, um, and, and let me caveat that by saying um, the service schools that we go to and all the armed forces are outstanding. They're excellent. I went to the infantry officer basic course in the Army. I went to the Armor Office Advanced course. I went to Commander General Staff College. <clears throat> I went to the Navy War College. And all of those courses were great. The one-year courses, you know, they go from August until May. And, uh, and in terms of the tactical, technical, organizational, um, strategic education that you get out of them, they're absolutely terrific. But it's not enough. It's absolutely not enough. Every single young leader or old leader in the military or corporate executive offices or young people in just going into jobs and corporations, you need to focus on your profession, the profession of arms, and read about leaders in the profession of arms who have faced difficult situations. And what did they do when they faced those situations? And select books about that. Uh, if, if, you, if you focused on the military, that's fine. Doesn't that, you can read books also that are not about the military. I mean, uh, when you look back at presidents or prime ministers of countries, they've written books on their life and what they did and the difficult situations they were faced with. And you learn from that. You see the, and, and so what happens is, you know, you, you, you fill your computer up with all these thoughts and ideas. And, uh, and let, let me just, if I can uh, give you some examples, and this gets back to uh, your question, Emily, earlier about the, the favorite books you've read. But <clears throat> one book I, I would recommend highly is Founding Fathers on Leadership by Donald T. Phillips. Now, this is about our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Thomas Paine, John Adams, General George Washington, who, who uh, without question, uh, used the, the values uh, and stayed with, uh, they held with those values, which were so important to give birth to our nation. And Gen General George Washington was faced with unbelievable challenges. Uh, and one of the most difficult ones for him was the winter of 1777, uh, when he asked the members of the Continental Army, 11,000 members of the Continental Army, uh, to leave their farms, their shops, their families, and go with him to a place called Valley Forge, where there was no food, <clears throat> no shelter, and without pay. And yet when he asked them to do that, 11,000 members of the Continental Army went to Valley Forge. And many came there without coats, without hats, without socks, without shoes, but they came. And many died of disease and malnutrition during the year, but more came during the, that, that uh, difficult winter, but more came. So by the spring of, of 1778, George Washington had 13,500 uh, members of the Continental Army ready to defend freedom against British tyranny. I mean, th those are, and how those leaders in the Continental Army and General George Washington and, and our founding fathers did that on a continual basis and made all that happen. So we have this nation we're so proud of today. 
and we have a, a constitution and, and, and we have all the all the documentation makes makes our nation so great and and uh and that's what it takes so so that's a book i think that to me was very inspiring about how how you do things and what you do and how you can overcome the kinds of adversity to get to where you want to be i'll tell you another book which is uh which is i i I've used an awful lot, and it's called Reengineering the Corporation uh, by Hammer and Champy. It's a book that was written probably 30 years ago, um, but it's an excellent book in terms of the business processes that you have. And you're a leader, and I don't care if you're a platoon leader or you're a brigade commander or, or a CG of Fifth Army. There's a process for doing business every day. And there are four questions that I asked from that time on when I read that book for every single command I was in. And the first question is, what is it that you do? You know, you think that's a pretty basic question, but you should be able to know the answer to it like that. <laughs> what is it that you do? And, and, and then the second question is, why do you do that? Boy, you better be able to answer it. There ought to be a mission statement. There ought to be a document. There ought to be some justification. And the reason is because, you know, and, and in the Army, you're only funded for what you're supposed to do. And you may find as you lay out the business process that you're doing a whole bunch of other things that you're not funded for, that you're not supposed to be doing. Somebody decided it was a good idea down the line and somebody else has taken up the slack and doing it, but you're not supposed to. I'll tell you what I did when I ran into those things. I deleted them. I said, well, we're not supposed to do it. Nobody's making us do it. So I'm not gonna do it anymore. And and that really, that really happened to me. I remember I was uh, with a bunch of company commanders um, in the old guard and they were talking to me uh, i said well what are, this was after a, a, a training briefing we had and uh, i said well, what are some of the things that bother you what's what's on your mind what what things would you change if you could as one company came in and said sir we're really tired of uh, i mean it's 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 taken a whole company uh, every rotation to um, take care of all these funerals that are outside arlington national cemetery i mean we're we've got bands filled with um, soldiers and a bugler and a, and a chaplain and um, you know, flag bearers and and they're going to Virginia and Maryland and West far away as West Virginia to do these funerals. And I said, really. So I went back to my headquarters in MDW and I said, give me the uh, the document that says we're required to do that the old guard is required to do funerals outside of Arlington National Cemetery. And there wasn't one. They couldn't find one. <laughs> so I deleted the requirement. And the response and the answer was there was one full old guard company available every week that could do other training that they needed to do, you know, because in addition to all the ceremonies, they had to buy their rifle and do all the other things to keep up with their readiness. And you know what I found out? I found out that, you know, because I got a call from the um the president of the Funeral Directors Association, they'd been selling this package out to all the uh, funeral homes everywhere. And somebody thought it was a good idea. And I said, and they, and they complained to me. And I said, hey, <laughs> there's no requirement. The United States Army, I have no directive and no authority. And so I'm not gonna do it, funeral director. You got that? That terminated that, that took care of that. It went away. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, then then the other question you ask is, why do we do it that way? You know, in other words, you know, you, you, okay, you have to do that. But why do we do it that way? And and again, when you lay out the process, sometimes you find there's defects in the production process. And so you need to change the defects. And the, the last question, is there a better way? Sure there is. There's a lot better ways to do things. And so you know, when you catch on those things, you just, you know, you say, okay, fine, we, we, won't, uh, we won't do that. You know, like I had, <laughs> I remember I was coming to my quarters one day at Fort McNair when I was a CGMDW, and there was a backhoe sitting out in front of the sidewalk in front of my um, quarters. He was about to pick up the cement. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, we're picking up all the cement. There was a cement leading up to the quarters and the cement along the sidewalk that went down. I said, wait a minute. Why are you doing that? So anyway, I got a call from the garrison commander and he said, well, we've only got so much money left in our cement um, funding that we had for the year. And so we're going to use it up. I said, yeah, but 
you know, why do you, why do you want this, this perfectly good cement here? You say, well, they have cracks in them. I said, all cement has cracks in them. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> what? what? I don't understand that. He said, well, he said, yeah, but we also are building handicap access um, ramps for the golf course. I said, what? I terminated the, the cement <laughs> program <laughs> because, they, you know, I mean, so in other words, you, you got to look at a different way of doing business. I mean, you, why do you want to waste all that money and all that time and all that effort on something that, you know, you don't need to have, I mean, it doesn't need to get done. Uh, the other thing I was briefed on was, you know, Fort McNair. Uh, you've been there, Fort McNair, uh, Chief Master Sergeant? Uh, no, no, sir, I haven't been. I haven't been to Fort yeah, McNair well, yet. Yeah, they have the National War College and the um, Industrial War College over there. And um, you know, the, I guess the uh, uh, Chief of Military History and then the CG, the Military District of Washington is there and so forth. But anyway, it's, uh, it's an old post. I've been there for a long time. When I first came there, I was briefed that um, uh, they'd already invested forty thousand dollars in a um, a plan uh, to totally redo uh, the um, wall around the um, uh, Fort McNair because it was right there on the Potomac River, and um, and it was going to be about an eight million dollar project. And I thought about that, and I said, "What? Wait a minute! I walk my dog along that wall in the morning." Why, why do we need to um, to uh, replace the wall? And, um, you know, this was in uh, 1990, 1995, I think. And um, so anyway, uh, I the engineer said, oh, well, there's a lot of leaks in the wall. There's erosion and all that. I said, all right, you come on over this afternoon and show me that erosion, will you? Because I missed it. Well, we walked hmm. completely around the wall. And I couldn't find any erosion. I couldn't find any leaks. I couldn't find anything. So I canceled the program. That was 25 years ago. The wall's still there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I think we saved $8 million. Well, they were stones that were put in there back in 1850, you know, so they weren't going to go anywhere. Well, anyway, that's um, uh, that. You, you get that from that kind of professional reading. Let me tell you, mention one other book. It's a, it's a book called Five Point Play by Coach Mike Krzyzewski. And um, you, you might say, well, how does a basketball coach get involved and, you know, um, it'd be a good thing for uh, young officers or NCOs to learn about? Well, um, Coach K wins. And the last time I looked, um, the, the purpose of the U.S. Armed Forces is to fight and win our nation's wars. And he had five values that that he established with every team that he had, whether at the collegiate level or the NBA players that he used to win every single Olympic team, a, a gold medal that he won. And he always won. He's, so he knows how to win. And um, so th these five um, values are trust, caring, pride, collective responsibility, and communications. And when you think about those five, they can be used by anybody at any level, any time. You know, collective responsibility, for example. Yeah, and I, I was with him for about three hours one afternoon. He was talking to me about some of these things. And he said, you know, it's just like when your troops cross the line of departure. When, when what my job is to do and my assistant coaches is, is, is to make sure that our players are ready for the game. But when they step on that court, that's their responsibility to win the game. And they know that. That's why we have collective responsibility. Our responsibility is to tell you how to win it. And your job is to win the game. So now the accountability is thrown on those players. And they understand it. And they get serious about winning. So anyway, that's just, just my thoughts about um, uh, what professional reading can do to help you at every single level. And, but you've got to do it from the time you're a second lieutenant until whenever, whatever, whatever, whatever you rise to. I think it's, it's important to be involved in that professional reading. And I, I read uh, the book by Coach K because of the Netflix documentary, The Redeem Team. And it was amazing how he was able to bring all these big 
leaders and come together and work as one team, especially because, you know, you had Kobe Bryant, who is an alpha, you had LeBron James, and just for someone to have that leadership skill to get everyone to just put down that alpha mentali- uh, mentality um, and work as a team, I was like, I got to read this book. Because <laughs> if you can tame LeBron and Kobe, I mean, you've got, a, you know, a natural born leadership gift. But um as a reminder, oh, I'm sorry. Were you gonna? Okay, sorry. As a reminder, authorized shoppers can purchase Standing Tall Leadership Lessons in Life of a Soldier tax free at shopmyexchange.com or in select exchange stores. And also for our Chief Chat viewers, uh, this episode is available on YouTube and Spotify, and you can rewatch with your friends or catch up with past episodes. Uh, the Chief Tab team would like to wish our viewers a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday uh, next week. And uh, be sure to join us back here at 3 p.m. Central on November 29th as we wrap the month up with uh, CEO Brett Barish and rapper and entrepreneur Rick Ross. Uh, join us again on Tuesday, December 6th, as we prepare for the Ar- big Army-Navy game with the hot takes on the upcoming matchup from sports analyst John Sadak and uh, Ross Tucker. And, sir... You, you've uh, definitely inspired me. Um, uh, you, you just dropped off a few awesome nuggets about um, uh, not being funded for something and deleting requirements. So I'm, when I get home and my wife wants to go on a, on a nice date, I'm like, listen, I'm, I'm not funded for this requirement and I'm deleting the requirement. <laughs> I was like, now you got me in trouble. <laughs> well she's gonna she's gonna ask me to stop ha- stop interviewing these uh military leaders out here because i'm i'm that's I'm right taking I'm, I'm taking these leadership tools and using them out of co- out of context yeah hey i want to tell you this has been great i have really enjoyed this and i think it's because of your personalities and your courtesies and just the way you make everybody feel comfortable uh you know you, you just want to talk and talk some more i just looked up did we talk for an hour and 20 minutes Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> we have. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank no, you so much. I appreciate it. No, no. Thank you so much, sir, for, for your leadership and, and just, you know, spe- specifically for your time, but just for your leadership and the, the leadership that you've imparted on a, a lot of military leaders that are still serving right now. So your legacy was going to live on forever. And we appreciate you you coming on the show. And, and uh, we, we're definitely supporting your book here at The Exchange. And and uh, I hope to meet you in the future at some point, some point in time. If you're, if you're at the Army Navy game, I'll definitely be there. So uh, uh, maybe we can cross paths at some point, point in life. So, uh, but thank you so much it for hanging out with who, us. And we, yeah, it depends on who you're rooting for. What well, we meet up. Well, I, I, I kind of don't have a choice uh, right at this point, sir. I, I, I got to go <laughs> Army beat Navy. <laughs> Good. Good. Even though my, even though my Marine buddies are probably kicking me in the will be kicking me in the butt uh, after they see this yeah. interview. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's, you know, I know what my bread is buttered right now, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, sir, so, sir, if you don't mind us uh, uh, staying on the line till after the live is over with, so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes. But um, uh, I just, again, on, on the show, I just want to thank you for your time and, and thank you for, for being an awesome American. So uh, with that being said, uh, Chief Chat out.